Thank you, Anna. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slide I started with. Uh, I'm, fortunately, I'm not giving a chalk talk, but I'll make it slow enough that it looks like a chalk talk, right? So we started with two random variables, x and x hat. And then you can always write mutual information in this form and uh, local differential privacy in this form. And something I'm hoping you may be able to get from this talk is maybe a bunch of measures that go from here, and then there's maximal leakage, and then there's LDP, and maybe epsilon delta, maybe Renya, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's our hope. Um, so I'm going to go back to maximal leakage for a minute. I think you know it, so I'm just going to put it in here. Um, most of my slides will go in this fashion, step by step. So, <laughs> so we're so inspired by Aaron's work that despite all our agreement to use the same notation, my student used his original notation, which was U instead of S. <laughs> so, and it was just too late to go back and change it, so we'll stick with U. U is your secret variable, or any function of X. So this question mark sort of means any function of X. Okay, uh, and I, I want to iterate this because you will sometimes see just an arrow, and that means a specific function of x. Okay, I'll make that clear in a bit. Um, so you know this, right? It's a it's a ratio, and uh, and then there's the supremum over all possible functions of x that that u captures. Okay, um, I I want to sort of hint this. I feel this is an adversary. For me, this definition is from an adversarial viewpoint. The adversary gains something from having this release. And the adversary is assumed to be a reasonably strong adversary because it has this prior knowledge. Maybe Aaron, Aaron doesn't agree with me. Perhaps I OK. Um, one of the things I hope comes out of this is some relationship between these things. OK? So this part of the talk is really uh, it's really the work of my awesome graduate student and my amazing colleague, Oliver, and uh, my another amazing collaborator, Flavio. All right, so um, here's our problem set up, right? X is some, X is a random variable. It could also be a data set. X hat is some output from this random variable through this mapping, randomized mechanism, right? U could be any function of X. And then I look at an adversary that wishes to estimate U as U hat from X hat. Okay, that's what all of this is. All right. Um, what I'm actually going to do is take all these measures and look at it from a loss function viewpoint. Okay. All right. So I just already said this. This is my pictorial notation. If you see a question mark with that arrow, it means any U. All right. And if you, for example, this need not just be blue red. It could have been any thing. If you see just a pure arrow because I will introduce a very specific measure for that, which then generalizes to this. Then it's a very specific U. I call it context aware. For example, it could be just race, right, in the other data set. OK. All right. So what I'm going to do first is take a loss function perspective. So everybody knows mutual information here, right? There's x, there's x hat, there's some U that I'm interested in that's related to x. I'm going to estimate it as U hat. OK. So I have this Markov chain. OK, so here's a loss function I'm going to look at, log loss. right? So the adversary is using this loss function. This is what it wants to minimize. right? So it makes an estimate of u as u hat, right? of u hat as some u, given x hat, and it takes the log of the negative log of that. right? So immediately, what the adversary strategy is, is the one that minimizes this loss function. OK. Um, so here's a definition of what the adversary gains. It's the, uh, so obviously, this is going to be smaller than without having this x hat. So it's the gain or the decrease in the loss, the regret, as a result of having x hat. Okay. So you work it out. You get the mutual information between u and x hat. OK. All right. So from the data processing inequality, I take a supremum over all possible such U's, I get mutual information. So in some sense, if I'm minimizing mutual information, I'm using, an, I'm using a, um, so I'm actually doing some kind of uh, learning algorithm where I use log loss as the regret function. Okay? And the learning algorithm is perhaps even learning the distribution empirically in some application. Okay. 
All right, so, so basically what this means is that the, this is an adversary that's refining its belief, and its inference gain is really just the mutual information. All right, so now I'm going to give you a loss function perspective on maximal leakage. Okay, so now if you take the loss function as the probability of guessing error, right? So this is the probability of correctly guessing. One minus this is the probability of error. Okay. Um, then if I minimize this on average, right? So the, the optimal adversary strategy is to pick the one that minimizes, and you know what that is, that's the best guess, right? The loss function that becomes a zero one loss function. In other words, what I started with was the sigmoid loss function, and in the limit of the best adversarial strategy, which is picking the u that's the most likely to occur given this x hat, I get the zero one loss function. What do you mean you get the zero loss function? Uh, if you put back this strategy in there, this loss function actually basically just gives me the zero one loss function. It gives, it has a weight of zero for the right correct guess and a weight of one for all other guesses. <coughs> why, why didn't you start with the zero one loss function? Why didn't I start with the zero one? Started with the a soft loss. Right? No, because actually the loss functions are all soft classes, soft soft losses, and it's only in the limit. I mean, even in the universe of loss functions, I mean, this is just the sigmoid loss function. And it's only when you put the right strategy in place do you get zero one. Okay. So then. Another way of writing maximum leakage is basically the gain for the adversary. So this is, this is what its loss would have been. So this is a slightly different way of writing it. Here I take the, uh, I mean, it's a log of a ratio of two things, right? Exactly this, where the adversary was first minimizing this exact loss function, but without any knowledge, and then minimizing it with this. Oh, what I did here was the loss function is one minus the probability of correctly guessing. So you maximize when you just take the reward function, which is the probability of correctly guessing. So the underlying loss function for maximum leakage is really just the probability of correctly guessing. Okay, so, so the adversary here is picking both u and p u hat given x hat? Yes. Is right? It picks both of those. And it picks a realization and a distribution. Um, uh, the, no, the adversary is still refining a belief, but the belief, the way it's going to refine this belief is using this loss function. Sorry, U is the actual secret thing. It only picks, the adversary just picks P, U hat given X. That's right. That's the adversary strategy, but in, in this, in this, for this particular function, the adversary strategy boils down to actually a point instead of a, a belief. It's one one final answer, it's a hard decision instead of a soft decision like it was for mutual information. Yeah? Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, so I should have put that supremum in there. I want to put the supremum in there. Okay. <coughs> Move on. All right, so the way I look at maximum leakage is it quantifies the maximum inf inf inference gain that a guessing adversary. I think that's what uh, Aaron called it, right? Okay, so here's a sort of a visualization of what we just did. If the adversary wanted to estimate something that's a binomial random variable, what it would do if it uses, uses log loss, as is done in often learning applications, is get this soft decision at the end probably make a hard decision after that. But if you use maximum leakage, if you use zero one loss, if you could, then you would get this exact point. Or if you use sigmoid loss, it boils down to the zero one loss, and you get one, you make one decision. Okay. So what, what's the, the? The x-axis is just the values of u. These are values of 
values of? Uh, well, because you, you know, U has 20 possibilities. There are 20, um, it's a binomial, right? So it's 20 coin flips. There's uh, up to 20 heads or zero heads, right? So if, if the best the adversary could, could do was actually learn the original prior itself, this is what the distribution would look like, is all I'm saying. The posterior would look like that. So the assumption here is you're trying to guess a secret, which is a discrete number between 0 and 20. And you happen to have access to the prior on that secret. Right. OK, I see. Now I think I got it. So, uh, so I, you probably said this like four different ways. I'll try it. So you're, you're imagining the adversary's output here rather than just a, a specific guess, is actually a distribution. Yes. And you want to maximize some score of that distribution. And if the score you're maximizing is like the probability of agreement, then you should just, that distribution should be a point distribution. If you're trying to minimize some expected sort of KL style thing, then you get mutual information and the. the and then the, 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 it's a soft position. Like the full posterior distribution. Correct. I hope everybody is as violently in agreement with me as Adam is. OK. Um, so what I'm going to do is interpolate between these two and introduce a loss function first. And I call it alpha loss. Right? So it's not very hard to do this. Alpha is going to take a value from 1 to infinity. OK? And here's what I do. I'm still looking at a soft decision, the probability. But I raise it to this power, 1 minus 1 over alpha. And then I'm going to scale it by alpha over alpha minus one. Okay. The scaling is just to get all the Renyi stuff to go through later. Right? Okay. So if you take this loss function, you apply the limit as alpha goes to 1, you get log loss. And it's continuous extension at alpha, go, as, at alpha equals infinity, you get the sigmoid loss. So here's a plot of how that looks like. You know, the same, um, so this is just as a function of the probability, you know, from 0 to 1. So log loss is actually going to go off, right? It's, it's, um, it's nice and convex, but it also has a singularity at 0. And these other things, and in the limit, you can see the sigmoid loss just coming as a straight line. So the probability of error. OK. All right. Um, so I'm going to build a whole class of measures based on this loss function. It's not very hard to see now. Um, and to do that, so keep in mind, this is sort of the probability of correctly guessing some uh, exponent, uh, you know, some, some power of the probability. <laughs> right? So I minimize this as equivalent to maximizing just that probability. Right? Just keep that in mind as you go along. Um, OK, so my information leakage is the scale log logarithmic increase in expected reward. So it's very similar to maximal leakage in that sense. Right? So, but I'm going to introduce two measures. One where I say I know u, and I'm only worried about a particular u. And other, or s, and other where I look at all possible random functions s okay. of the data x. OK. So, I know all of you know this, but just bear with me, because I think when you see those measures later, it might help you. Uh, everybody knows Shannon entropy, and everybody also knows Renyi entropy. And Shannon is a special case of Renyi for alpha equals 1. And Renyi, the way the measure is, is it's actually like the alpha norm of the probability that's used to give you some measure of information. Right? OK. Um, then everybody knows KL distance. <coughs> And KL distance is a special case of the Renyi divergence for alpha equals 1. And so the Renyi divergence is sort of written like this. I could write it out, but this, this is what it is. And here it's really the expectation over this probability in the denominator. Okay. Um, the reason I'm doing this is just because these measures come up, so maybe some visualization might help. So mutual information can be written in a whole bunch of different ways and through, uh, through the Kale divergence, and also as a minimum of the Kale divergence for this output. And this output happens to be the marginal of the joint distribution of x and y. Right? That is the one that gives you mutual information. So as, as Aaron said earlier, when it comes to generalizing Renyi entropy to get, come up with some, some other versions of mutual information, there are many possibilities. So Arimoto was one who came up with this possibility. He said, why don't I just do it just the way Shannon did it? It's the difference of the Arimoto entropy for some x 
minus its, uh, the, the Renyi entropy for some x minus the conditional Renyi entropy of x given some release, say, y. Okay? And this is already called, uh, there's an A up here because it's in honor of Arimoto who came up with this conditional Renyi entropy measure. Okay? Um, so the right way to just vaguely visualize this is as follows. This is a posterior, if you think about going from x to y. By the way, this doesn't have the same beautiful Shannon-like properties of it's not symmetric. Okay? So we go from x to y, and so you're looking at, for every output, the conditional of x. You take its norm, and you take that weight, weighted some of that. Okay? So this is a measure of uh, information. It's called the Arimoto Mutual Information. So you can subtract this and this, and you get the Arimoto Mutual Information. Right? So another generalization is the Simpson that sort of came out of uh, uh, Aaron's talk. Aaron spoke about Simpson for alpha equals infinity. But you could look at Simpson for all alpha from 1 to infinity. For alpha equals 1, you get back mutual information. Okay. Simpson is defined very differently. Simpson looks at the Renyi divergence of a joint distribution of x and y, and then and its distance to this product of the marginals. And the y that actually minimizes this is not just the marginal of pxy for y; it is a tilted marginal. Um, so a visualization of that is slightly different. Now you actually look at the inner product for, uh, for any output of the conditional and the, the, input, the, the x itself. Okay? So it's just, I try to be German. I mean, Simpson came at it from this notion of information radius. You give me a whole bunch of conditional distributions at some weights. How do I come up with a centroid for it? And that was Simpson's focus. The only reason I bring up these things is these measures come up when we look at alpha. And just going back, so presumably the the best, like in the in the Shannon context, the best sort of distribution on Y is really the, the unmodified marginal. Do we? It's, it's the marginal of the joint distribution right. PXY. Here, the marginal is a is a tilted. Um, so I have to be a little bit careful. It's the, uh, the yeah. So the marginal on y would be the, the the probability of y raised to alpha divided by its sum of that. So it's a uh, it, it's what's called a tilted distribution. That's what it should be. And then when you plug it back in, you would get this. Okay. So this alpha is sort of like a tilting. You, you, so visually, actually, okay, I'll get to the, it comes later in the plot. What you're doing with these loss functions is you're contracting something. I think I'll come to that in a few minutes. You'll see that. All right, so first what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on a particular U, right? And introduce, use this loss function definition to come up with a measure, right? Okay, so here's my definition. So because I'm focusing on a particular U, I take a joint distribution of U and X hat. And there's an estimator u hat, which is the same support as u. So the alpha leakage from u to x hat is defined as follows. So the adversary starts with some prior knowledge. But now I take that probability and raise it to 1 minus 1 over alpha. When I release x hat, the adversary can do better. right? So I'm taking my reward function. I'm going to take its average and then find the best estimator. Scale it. Okay. All right. So, and uh, maximal alpha leakage then just becomes this particular quantity I just defined alpha leakage, where I take the supremum over all possible use, satisfying this Markov and chain. Um, so if I start with simplifying this alpha leakage, I get the following. 
basically what I'm going to tell you is that Alpha leakage would have given you, so it, was, it could have been race in my um, compass data set, right? Given some release by, say, Broward County, how much can I leak about the particular race thing is really the Arimoto mutual information of order alpha if I use that loss function as an adversary. Okay. So if I use a loss function that was my posterior belief raised to 1 minus 1 over alpha, I get the Arimoto mutual information. Okay. And how this comes about, I basically do this optimization and do this optimization, and then it's not very hard to see that for each optimization, the, the, the adversary strategy is just the tilted, this is called a tilted belief. And what it is is really, so raised to one would have been exactly what the zero one loss function would have achieved, what maximum leakage sort of would have done. You would take the best the, uh, posterior that you could if you had complete statistical information. Here you take it to alpha and you normalize. Okay. So when you work this out, this just turns out to be the Arimoto mutual. Um, I'm going to illustrate this strategy of the adversary for you for a second. All right. Um, so, now this is the prior. If I raise, you know, independent of, what the, uh, independent of what the adversary has information, suppose the adversary had no release, but it had to figure it out using this loss function. This is the PU as the prior, and then I, if I took this tilted distribution, right, this is what it looks like. So if alpha is 1, what the adversary effectively comes up with is a soft decision, which is the entire belief. Okay. And if PU is infinity, uh, if alpha is infinity, I make one guess. For all, all alphas in between, I'm sort of contracting the, I'm basically ignoring the outliers as much as possible. I weight the outliers less. In the limit of weighting the outliers less, in the limit at alpha is equal to infinity, I'm only giving all the weight to the most likely event. Questions? I'm using the same binomial distribution, and just, this is a sort of visualization, yes? So I'm trying to understand like a interpretation of this alpha parameter. Hmm. Somebody who's not so uh, uh, used to working with things like writing entropy. Okay. Uh, I mean, I've seen it. I don't even know what it is, but I don't know how to think about alpha. Is alpha somehow like how <laughs> confident I am in my prior? Mm. If, if, I'm, if I'm supremely confident in my prior and the timing attack, timing packets of the keyboard, uh, like you shouldn't give me any information because I like, really know the distribution of passwords, maybe. Um, but if I am not so confident in my prior, then I should depend heavily on this timing, timing information from the keyboard. I'm just, is that how I should be thinking about alpha? Um, how much I'm weighting my prior and this I, um, Well, you know, you're weighting your prior and posterior by the same things. Because this alpha appears in the numerator and denominator, right? Um, let's just go back for a minute here. See? <laughs> I would have done, whether I had a release or not, I would have done the same thing. So the right way to look at it from a loss function perspective is, um, if I could, in an ideal universe, do something like a zero one, make a single decision, I would. One of the reasons log loss is used in learning applications, besides it's being convex, uh, is it's just easier for me to do a belief until the very end and then make a decision, right? Now, but the problem with that belief is that it's weighting everything, including the outliers. So it sometimes gets pulled down by the outliers. What this is telling me is maybe I can just weight the most likely ones in the limit. When I go to alpha equals infinity, I'm only picking one. So it's just sort of swooping from, you know, take, the, take a belief over every possible outcome to take, just make one decision. 
And this tells me maybe you just keep contracting that and just keep a list of the most likely. So for every increasing alpha, my list gets smaller and smaller of the most likely. So it's really a loss function way of doing a determination on what I keep or not keep. Does that make any sense? Yes. Um, to me, the, the alpha parameter is really chosen by the analyst, not the adversary. That's so you know, the analyst would pick the alpha. I mean, given the alpha, the adversary's optimal strategy is then to pick that tilted thing that she had there. But the alpha is not so much a reflection of how confident the adversary is at what it's doing. It kind of reflects what the analyst cares about protecting or in what sense they care about protecting it. So I guess you could rephrase the question then, well, if I'm the analyst, how do I pick the alpha? Um, that I don't, I'm not sure how to answer. It's a, this is a great observation. Um, so if I, I'll come to it a little bit later. Because depending on whether I do alpha leakage or maximum alpha leakage, in both cases, it's another hyperparameter tuning if you look at it that way. But in one case, it's more important than the other. Just to, because in one case, there's no monotonicity, and the other there is. Just to understand what Aaron's comment was, do you mean the mechanism designer, not the analyst? person who's designing the arrow from X to XF. That's um, the person who picks it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's who you went by the analyst. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Why? As an adversary, I would try all alphas. I'm not sure I'm convinced by your argument. If I pick a loss function, I'm an adversary. I can pick any loss function. If I could really do 0, 1, which would be like factoring a number, I would do it. But then if you take supremum over alpha, you would end up with maximum, maximum leakage. Oh, well, it depends on what I, as a data curator, decide to use as a measure. There's always that problem. That's why Aaron, I think, is suggesting that the data holder is the person to decide what alpha the data holder should be aware of what kind of adversary may glean if I used a different alpha. What the adversary. All I'm saying is the adversary could do its own learning given a release. It's entirely possible I picked an alpha and the adversary learned more from some other alpha. I, I don't know. I'm not giving you the answer out yet. That's all I'm saying. OK. Um, I, I'm also new to this. So I, I think like. Uh, so am I. <laughs> can, can I like maybe step up from Alon's question? Um, if, if the mechanism designer decides on this alpha, like what will be the adversary in my mind? Um, and, and I want to be a, such a mechanism designer. Should I think of the alpha being one or alpha being infinity? If I want to, as you pointed out, protect outliers. So maybe some people in my data are really unusual and those presumably, according to some story or another, are the people whose, whose, whose privacy I should care about the most. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by, if I really want to protect them, sh like what alpha should I think of? I mean, I know this is kind of the question, like what epsilon should I think of? That's the canonical question. Yeah. I actually, uh, I, I'm not going to answer this question for a little bit. Okay. Maybe towards the end, but even maybe then not. I don't know, because I'll, I'll tell you why I don't know the answer, but maybe towards the end. Yeah. Maybe I, I can try to different answer for that. So like the, I, I think the point is that you can try to understand how your mechanism would change and the information leakage would change as you vary this alpha, right, as a system designer. Mm -hmm. Because on one hand, you have something that looks like guessing. So uh, even though the probability of correctly guessing might not change a lot, the belief of an adversary like might be spread out over a set, but now it's concentrated. Even though if they guess from that set, like the the probability of correctly guessing might still be roughly the same. So, from the point of view of this a designer, what you, ideally what you would want to do is to design your mechanism and see what kind of guarantees you have as you vary this alpha. And this goes from one end from revi revising your belief over the uh, secret information view or S. And on the other hand, what is the probability of correctly guessing? And I think the interesting thing about this analysis is that when you start looking at mechanisms that try to control alpha leakage for a given alpha, you want to maybe embed your mechanism with a claim that, look, we have the same mechanism is optimal for a range of alphas or something like that. Does that help answer? In some cases. Yeah, in some cases. Yeah. So it's but, but you'll also start seeing this 
thing you may see in Rainier differential privacy, which is you'll start seeing that it concentrates very quickly. And for some alphas beyond, say, four, it'll pretty much become the same. Was, but I, I don't think that answers the question. This is why I have I a... Add what Lolita said, right? Like, you know, parameters are tuned every day. Yes. <laughs> it's one more parameter. After a while, yeah, it's just. Uh, you know. No, but I think his, his question is uh, should we look at these loss functions from the viewpoint of the outliers? And. Uh, so that would be one objective to use to tune the parameters, right? That, uh, you know, so. Right. So if I was just doing learning, I think outliers are actually a problem because they. They cause more errors. From that viewpoint, I, I, I brought up outliers. From a privacy viewpoint, I want to think more before I give you an answer. Let me put it that way. So why don't we why not finish and maybe it'll become a little bit clearer. Great question, I just very big one. So <laughs> Okay. It's, it's, it's not yet fully concrete here either, right? So um, so maximal leakage is uh, by definition taking alpha leakage for a particular U and then um, just taking a supreme. Right? Over all possible random functions. So now I can simplify alpha leakage, and I told you how to do that. That's the Arimoto, uh, uh, Arimoto mutual information. And then I can do the same for maximal leakage. Okay, there's a little bit of math in here, but it's, I'm just going to write it out. So it's basically because of the way you take the supremum, effectively it becomes just a um, supremum over all possible distributions with the same support okay, as x. And so it's the Arimoto capacity, which turns out to be the same as the Simpson capacity. So those two quantities look different, but when you actually take a supremum over the input distribution or the x, I keep calling it input, maybe I'm just a communication theorist at heart, then you get these two quantities become the same thing. That may not mean much. But in the limit, this is for all alpha strictly greater than 1. For alpha equals 1, because I apply the limit of alpha before I apply the supremum, I get back mutual information and not Shannon capacity. I'm just preempting your question. Okay. All right. Uh, so alpha basically traverses this whole path. The, the proof is actually very, very similar to Aaron's. Uh, very similar, and it has two parts to it. One is that for any u, the supremum of the Arimoto is equal to the supremum of the Simpson. This can sort of be worked out. And the second is not the Arimoto, but the Simpson satisfies the data processing inequalities in both directions, which is what you need. The Simpson satisfies the data processing. So I can replace this u, supremum over all u, by this. And the achievability is quite similar, too. I mean, I'm going to construct a U, which is sort of shattering. It's slightly a little bit more general than the shattering thing, but it's very similar. The idea is that X is a deterministic function of U. Okay. Um, so where do we go from here? Yes. So be invariant to the marginal for X for all alpha, except for alpha equal 1, then. Yes. Is that right? okay. Yes. Because of the way I took the limit. But also because of how mutual information satisfies the data processing inequality. So um, I think uh, 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 Aaron said this too. But it turns out, so there's a little nuance here. There are two, t you know, you can look at data processing inequality in two directions, right? The, uh, as you folks uh, in the CSI know too. Um, Post-processing inequality, which is where I release x is y and then y is released as z. And so hopefully somebody learns less about x from z than uh, about y from z. Uh, no, OK, forward. I said the linkage. So somebody learns less about x from z than, about, uh, than, than y does from x. And then the other one is the linkage, where you, uh, so, yeah, so, so when you release in this sequential fashion, Z should learn less about X than it does about Y. So the interesting thing is that, um, 
is what I will say. Maximum alpha leakage satisfies both. When I take that supremum over all use, you get both. Whereas if I picked a particular U to hide like race, I get post-processing, but I will not get linkage. So my alpha leakage does not give me linkage. That sort of is important because I have to tune over alpha. So there's some alpha in between that may be more informative than the alpha at the ends. Okay. Um, this composition is a, uh, yes? The statement in the, the known, U, like the fixed U case, the statement of linkage would be that if you had a U that was kind of hidden behind both X and Y. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be U, X, Y, Z. Behind X in some sense. So you'd only consider U's, I guess, that were such that U, X, Y, Z form a markup chain. You wouldn't consider U's that, you know, such that U, Y, Z forms a markup chain, but not U, X, Y, Z. Uh, I think U, X, Y, Z form a Markov chain, and it's still possible in spite of that Markov chain to uh, oh, right. okay. learn. That's what I'm asking. Yes. Yes, because Arimoto does not have a data processing inequality that reverse direction. And I think it follows from the fact that um, because this, and I think this happens for Simpson too, but for somehow for Arimoto, this follows from the fact that. Um, it's not symmetric. And so you just can't write it the other way and then you have this bound of log of the cardinality. Um, it, 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 it. Simpson happens to satisfy the data processing inequality in both directions. Even without the supremum. But when you put the supremum, you keep that. So Maximum alpha leakage satisfies it in both directions. But Arimoto doesn't, so then it follows through for us. If you use alpha leakage, I mean, so in a lot of, in practice, if you gave me a data set, and if I had to do this in some kind of generative model, where I model the adversary, and I use a particular alpha loss function, then I'm modeling the adversary to be that particular loss function behavior. Uh, I'm sort of minimizing Arimoto mutual information, but I have to tune over this alpha to do the right thing. Okay. Um, this composition is very similar to what, he, which he didn't even go over. It's very simple because it's a weak composition as viewed in differential privacy. I have a data set, I release it as say, x1 hat and another one is x2 hat and suppose these two guys you know, colluded with each other and had both x1 and x2 hat, then I, what I can say is that um, you know, the, the total leakage will always be bounded by the sum of these two. Okay. So it's not very, very hard. It actually again follows from taking these suprema and things like that in our expressions. So here, here's the thing. When it comes to maximal alpha leakage, when I allow you, I give you a guarantee using my loss function approach for all possible functions u, then that, turn, that quantity turns out to be monotonic. So Aaron had this bound. Mutual information is less than or equal to, and he also said it for capacity, is less than or equal to maximal leakage. It turns out now there's a whole sweep in there from alpha equals one to infinity, you're monotonically uh, non-decreasing. Yeah, yeah. You're non-decreasing, basically. You've never written monotonically. It's just non-decreasing. Right. Um, and 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 the other cute thing about it is it's actually quasi-convex in the mechanism okay. that allows you to learn the mechanism some, using some techniques. Okay. Um, so this is again similar to what Aaron wrote with the caveat. I'm assuming that x hat. So maximal leakage is lower. It's a positive quantity, um, strictly non-negative. It's lower bounded by 0. And I'll tell you when that happens. And it's upper bounded by the log of the cardinality of this data you have x, assuming that the data you release is either the same ca uh, cardinality or less. Okay, Same alphabet, but small. 
smaller alphabet or the same size. All right, for mutual, except for alpha equals one, then you get the entropy. Okay, it's the way the limits work. All right, so zero leakage obviously is when you release something that's independent. Okay. Why are you staring hard at it? Uh, is, there, is there some way of interpolating between those, those bounds? Like there's, there's no, like, it might not be Renyi entropy, but there's no kind of alpha notion of entropy that you, that you can express as a, give as an upper bound in place of just log the alphabet size. Uh, I had a very long chat with Vincent Tan about this at some point. I, 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 to the best of our knowledge, that doesn't seem to exist at the moment. Maybe these bounds are loose. What is the alpha self leakage? Like maximal leakage of order alpha from x to itself? Uh, it's, it's actually log x. So this is four, the log yeah. is four size. Yeah, so this is, this is true for any alpha. Uh -huh. Except one, I guess. Okay. Maybe we can do better and we haven't thought hard about it. I mean, you would think that maybe it would be a function of alpha and go up to. I mean, the self leakage is, then has this abrupt property. This, the leakage from yeah. x to itself as a function of alpha is entropy for alpha equals 1 and is log of the sports size for every other alpha. Yeah, so I mean, that indicates so you can't probably a proof. Yeah. yeah, it's probably a fundamental thing in that. Just, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think it's because of the, the maximum that we take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Self leakage is the full leakage that you can get, and it's exactly what we just said. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to take uh, an application. I don't see any social scientists here, but I'll still pitch this idea. Perhaps there are some I don't know. All right. So here's the problem, right? Suppose you were the census, and your job is to publish a data set. You have a data set, and you have to publish it. And the goal of this publishing should be that whatever you had as a contingency table that you got from your original data set, and what you publish, those two tables should be very, very close. So I ignore all these contingency table words. There's too many words for me. I use what, what I've learned. I call it a type, right? An empirical distribution on my census data should be close to the releases empirical distribution. I'm going to call them both types. Okay. So, um, so here's our census data. And for some reason, this is what, that's an example of what we want to keep private. So I'm going to release this part of the data set. What I want is for any such instantiation, the released and the original should be very close in their distributions, empirical distributions. And you could use your favorite method to estimate the empirical distribution. I'm just going to do a counting argument. Very simple, right? And it doesn't really matter. My measure of leakage is maximal alpha leakage. Okay. Uh, I call this distortion or utility as hard. Hard because it really doesn't depend on the distribution. You give me any instantiation with probability one, what I release should be in a ball of radius with respect to the type. So whatever you release, the type of that, its empirical distribution should be within a ball of radius d relative to the original. Okay, I think this might be useful in practice, right? I mean, the census really needs to produce data sets for statistical value. So if I move too far away, maybe uh, that might be a problem. Okay. So, so these are the different instantiations that could happen from different years of collecting census data. Maybe we did it every year. You have all this. So for each one of these, I have to have the same guarantee. So this is not an average guarantee. Okay. All right. So the mapping is really independent of the distribution as a result of this, and you'll see that. Immediately, you see that local differential privacy is not possible in this setting. <coughs> it's not too hard to see that, right? Okay. Now, what's the trade-off problem? Uh, for, it's going to be, I've written these xn's and yn's because I mean it's a data set of size n, and that's what I'm using to estimate the empirical distribution, right? So I'm going to map xn to x hat n. Really, the n's didn't matter, but I... We wrote it out that way, such that for each instantiation of xn and its corresponding mapping, it's within a bounded radius for, for the types. Okay? Here's what happens. Um, I'm going to give you the optimal mechanism, and then I'll tell you how to compute this mechanism. All right? the, the optimal mechanism is as follows. If I knew the output distribution, the output distribution is basically going to, the output is going to lie within a ball of radius d from any particular census instantiation you're given. What I release. 
So what, what happens to it, the upper is really just normalized probabilities within that ball. So in other words, for every, every census you get, you have a bunch of releases that sit close by in this space. And this is how you would map to any of them. But how do I compute this output distribution? It turns out to be the solution okay, to a convex optimization problem. of the following form. So it's different for alpha equals one and alpha equals greater than one. For alpha equals one, it'll depend on the distribution. Let's talk about alpha greater than one for a moment. Okay, it, it's really a convex, so there's some math in here, but what I want you to take away is that this solution is not hard to compute, right? And it really does not, it only depends on the support for alpha greater than one. So I think it's easier to visualize this with an example. So let's assume the census only has a binary, uh, you know, n length binary string that it wishes to release, right? Um, so there are possibly n plus one types, right? N types. Um, so n plus one. So either there's zero ones or one ones or two ones up to eight ones in my release. So and then what these are showing you is that for a distance of three, um, that these are my nearest neighbors, all right? So there exists one release in here that satisfies, that minimizes this leakage, reveals the least about what the original uh, x is and all functions of it while preserving this distance requirement. And that's this. So I club all these into one, and I club all these into one. And I think it'd be this and this. Uh, this and this. This and this. Okay. The two takeaways here are I used a you know, the, the measure for, for leakage is obviously agnostic to the distribution of the data. The measure for distortion was also agnostic to the distribution of the data. It's a pretty harsh measure, strong measure. So what happens then is the only way to minimize both leakage and guarantee this utility was to sort of do the best you could by clubbing it. It's really like a, um, this is just a packing problem in some ways. All right, um, how much time do I have? I think I have about five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, Aaron didn't talk about side information, so I'm gonna very briefly touch on it, okay? Here's your visual for side information. You have your data set X, you're gonna release it as X hat, right? Obviously, you don't want this adversary to learn any function U, but now the adversary could have some Z that's obviously related, correlated with X and perhaps even arbitrarily correlated. Um, so what the adversary can refine now, if it had this release and has this knowledge, is some u hat given x hat and z. Okay. All right. So here's the first thing. We can capture this scenario through this Markov chain. So for any u, so then u, x, z, and x hat form a Markov chain. So this allows for any arbitrary relationship between u, x, z. But given x, z, x hat is independent of this. I mean, this, I mean the adversary could have any information in the universe. What's the most meaningful in re releasing, learning about u is really this Markov chain. That's all we are arguing. Okay. In other words, if the adversary had x and z, it's going to X hat will help it, it will not help it at all in learning anything more about you. Okay. All right. uh, yes. Yes. Um, I mean, we've looked at, we call it a conditional form of maximum key breadth and side of Yes, it, it is really inspired by your work, for sure. And in that case, like, it wasn't, uh, this is the markup chain that we used in the network, and um, 
I still to this day wonder if that's really the Markov chain that one should use or whether Z should be uh, combined with X hat rather than X. Uh, oh. I, I had lots of slides on that, and I just didn't put it in here, but we can talk offline about it, and I will we'll address that. You have the same question. Yeah, yeah I agree. And where it's just a question of whether does this, should the adversary be able to choose this secret based on Z, or should the, of course, you can use Z to guess the secret, but should the choice of the secret itself that it's trying to guess in the maximal case depend on Z? Depend on the realization of Z or not? Does it have to declare one U that it wants ahead of time and then the realization of Z merely helps it guess you. Like that's, that's what it boils down to, basically. So. But when you do the maximal, it's any U that's related to Z. How does it matter? Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can say there's, there's important things like passwords and keys and stuff, and that, those shouldn't depend on the realization of Z, right? So, but... I mean, the adversary could have anything in the universe except U. Yeah. Only those that are correlated would help. And, and, and... And if the adversary already, if the U dependent on the Z, then the adversary may already have a lot of U's, and it may still be interested in this particular U that is not entirely derivable from Z. You know what I'm saying? True. I mean, this is certainly the more pessimistic of the two. Like, this is like an opportunistic adversary who kind of selects the U that is trying to guess based on the realization of Z. So that's, that's certainly like, you know, the pessimist, more pessimistic of the two and the safer of the two, therefore. I mean, given all this, how much more can it learn? Yes. Okay. Um, so that's better, no? You always want the strongest adversary. Okay. All right. Um, so we're violently in agreement. So now I can actually generalize, maybe not, but okay. <laughs> we generalize alpha leakage to condition alpha leakage. And alpha leakage, keep in mind, is where I pick a U. All right. Now I have to take a joint distribution over this U, the release, and my side information. This is just in the definitional sense. It doesn't mean when I design the mechanism, I may need to do that, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Right? So again, it's a ratio. But in the numerator now, I condition on not just the release, but the information. What's the best guess I can come up with when I maximize this particular reward function relative to what's the best guess I can come up with when I maximize without the exam? Right? OK. So I think this. Uh, it's easy to see that this will simplify to the Arimoto conditional information, mutual information. Or conditional Arimoto informa mutual information. Isn't that what it's called? Conditional Arimoto mutual information. That's not very hard to see. More interesting is what happens when you take over all possible use you could have learned from this data set. And then now I take a Superman with respect to this Markov chain. Okay. All right. Um, OK. Uh, the only reason I put this up there is really for alpha equals one, you basically get the Shannon conditional uh, mutual information condition on this Z. More generally, you get this form, which is really the Arimoto channel capacity, where you're taking a maximum of all possible realizations of this adversary, which could be looked at as a channel state. The adversary is going to pick the best, you know, the adversary has a random variable zero. It could have a whole bunch of things. You pick one from it that's going to give you the most information. And, and the supremo inside now is actually, is only a supremo over the support of X condition on Z. Uh, just for the information theorists here, I don't know if this leads to a new definition of Simpson conditional. It was not clear to me. It's hard to do that, but just for those curious. OK, what, what's most interesting about this is how can we relate the two? Because if you can't relate with knowledge and without knowledge, then you're, it's a little concerning. And I think uh, maybe you've done this too. It sort of generalizes your result uh, for all alphas. And it basically says this. Under the following assumption, okay, this assumption, this Markov chain is very important. Whatever I release, right, condition on what data I have, what the adversary has is independent of what I release. In other words, I assume private randomness for the release. And really, the only useful thing the adversary should have is about you know, something correlated with the X itself. So under this Markov chain, you can show that the conditional maximal alpha leakage is always bounded by the unconditional. OK? 
because this Markov chain actually simplifies the expressions on the previous. So um, what this means is that if I did, know, did not know what your adversary has, I could still minimize this leakage measure and, and we'll be OK. So the adversary could have any side information. There's y. Is this supposed to be x hat? This is generating y in the lab? Yes. Is x hat? happens to us. Thank you. Yeah. So what we mean is we have private randomness. Okay. Questions? I'm mostly done. Here's how I'd like to actually visualize this. Oh, there's an example here. Uh, do you want me to do the example? It's very simple. Yes? Like five minutes. Okay. All right. So x is binary. And so a mapping from x to y is like a binary, x to x hat is a binary symmetric channel with crossover probability p. And really z, the way it's related to x is through another binary symmetric channel with crossover probability q. Right? So for, so let's look at the max, sorry, this is a typo. Maximal leakage, I mean, for alpha greater than one, it becomes distribution independent. Uh, it only depends on the channel, right? In this case, even though this was half. And for alpha equals one, you exactly get the Shannon. Mutual. All right. So if you had z, if the crossover probability is 0, which means x is equal to z, the conditional maximum leakage is 0. Because the adversary already has x. There's no more that is released through this private random channel, through this mechanism. OK? That's a good thing. All right. But if x, is, so if for alpha greater than 1, they turn out to be exactly the same. And for alpha equals 1, they're the same if q is, uh, q is half. Okay. In other words, yeah, that's a little bit of a problem because uh, you could learn more. Uh, yeah, this will be less than this otherwise. This is a toy example. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I want to do next is just visualize this in some way. So you get something out of it. I think you sort of saw this. Um, so the adversarial model in, in these measures, we're going from an adversary that just gets, uh, you know, refines a, a, a belief to, to, you know, it effectively contracts this refinement over a smaller and smaller support until it makes a one hard decision. So if you look at l local uh, differential privacy, I, I don't know if I can make a direct comparison, but it seems that the adversary is looking at any pairwise and making such a decision. Okay. Whereas here, you look at the entire alphabet while you make the decision. I don't know. But you, I don't even know if you're making a hard decision. It's uh, some probabilistic. Uh, uh, so here's how the, um, the, uh, the relationships go. <laughs> Um, so you have mutual information sitting right here. It actually depends on the source distribution. And then you have maximal alpha leakage, which is larger than this. Maximal leakage, which is larger than that. Local differential privacy, which is larger. There's this Renier where we sort of have this relationship that we can prove. The Renier is also larger than maximal alpha leakage. And then, then there's this. What, what we haven't been able to entirely do with great success is relate these two quantities. but. So wait, uh, which two depend only on the support of the source, the local and local ready, right? Um, um, local ready doesn't depend on the support of the source. I mean, it depends on the support of the output. I mean, it depends on the output, but not. Oh, oh, no, no, all of these depend on the, only through, on the source only via its support. That's what I'm ah, saying. I see, I see, that's what you mean. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in other words, you're not using any uh, input, dis the, the, the distribution of the data that you have to make a release at all in any of these cases. You only use it here. I see. Okay. I see. So here, I guess what you're saying, OK, 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 that makes sense. So q hat x is, uh, q x hat just takes into account the distribution. That's the output distribution. Even though you're doing all this because of the supremum, it, it, it you're not assuming any distribution for the input. Oh, I see. That's what all these measures are saying. But then the infimum is over, uh, so, uh, sorry, I am a little daft, but the infimum is over what then? The, the infimum is over the output distribution. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. 
influence over the output distribution. And, and that, that turns out to be a tilted uh, distribution because of this alpha. That's what we did before. I really cannot do such a relationship in the, in the, in the non-maximal case just for alpha because it's not really monotonic. And so that really is a hyperparameter that the, uh, I don't know who's the person who asked me the question. But, um, but I, I will be honest about something. Given these relationships, it is not a priori clear to me that I should just use one measure or another. Maybe it is to you. I mean, perhaps in a universe, to, to put it in a learning theory context, if we could all do zero one loss functions, we would all do that. We can't. So then maybe this is a good approximation for perhaps a zero one adversary, but even more so, um, Perhaps there's a way to relate this model to some adversarial loss function model. That's another way of looking at it. And, and maybe you could get more utility by just limiting yourself to these classes of adversaries in some context where it's sufficient, like yesterday's speaker sort of alluded. Those are the sort of takeaways I would have from this talk. And I'm done. One thing I do want to mention is we have been seeing this in a lot of our work is that it's related to epsilon delta d. You see those kinds of. You're smiling, Vitaly. Hmm? I mean, we could imagine that. I mean, certainly we know that that's from Rene and probably many other. Okay, so the leakages now know also to be related to epsilon delta. There's a recent paper from Rene, right? Uh, and some authors. Right, right, right. But that's for. That's Yes, for alpha equals infinity. But I think we're seeing that for, I think you can see it for any alpha. There is a corresponding epsilon delta is what I'm saying. It's not very hard to see that. I'm sorry, Kamalika, if I cut off any question you had. Sorry, Vitaly, you're saying there's a paper that shows that maximum alpha leakage implies epsilon delta. Yeah. I mean, the right notion is actually to compare this not, I mean, shouldn't, okay, the definition is the same as the local DP, but yeah. right? Actually, there's this notion of maximal information, approximate maximal information that have been where you're basically now looking at the entire sort of data set instead of just a single element. And local differential privacy would be applying this to individual, but here you're arguing that about the entire leakage from some mm -hmm. algorithm. So you should sort of look looking at the leakage about the entire data set. So then in this context, the notions, the parallel notions, or very similar ones, are referred to as maximal pressure, which is just uh, they have a relationship. joint distribution and the product of marginals. And the approximate version of it is where you basically like an approximate differential privacy, you allow some probability of, uh, you only look at uh, probabilities, uh, sort of ratio of efficiently highly uh, events, which have enough probability, and you subtract this uh, delta. Um, and basically, for these notions, that, uh, there is a recent paper which connects this maximum leakage to specifically uh, approximate max information. Uh, I mentioned that. Uh, and I think the Rene versions can also be mapped to approximate max information as well. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Okay. And one, one question before we wrap. So, is there, related to the choice of alpha uh, question, like, is is there a kind of an application in one can point to where there's like a relevant value of alpha that kind of jumps out to you as the right one and that alpha is not infinity? No, no, no. So uh, so Oliver and I have argued about this for hours and hours, discussed this for hours and hours. I don't I don't know if I think my answer is if you cannot implement an adversary. I mean, I don't know what kind of adversary you want to give the best guarantees against. I think that's what you should use. What you pick as a mechanism should be designed for the adversary you think is the most powerful that you want to give the best guarantees against. So going back a little bit, I took a different example where instead of taking a hard distortion, I did an average uh, distortion, meaning the distribution matters for this, you know, maybe uh, something like a Hamming distortion in the average. What happens in that case is that after some alpha, you start seeing the same mechanism 
for all alphas going to infinity. When I talked to Kunal at ITA, I observed that, I mean, they use this notion of concentrate, I mean, that for large alphas, this Renier is a very good proxy for epsilon delta. We're seeing that behavior when we do these mechanisms. You start to get the same epsilon delta mechanism after some alpha. And it's not surprising, because if you go back to the loss function viewpoint, a large class of, you, know, you can look at these loss functions that I presented, alpha loss, as a class of surrogate loss functions for 0, 1. And with, with alpha equals 3 or 4, you're probably already hardening to 0, 1. It's going to be very hard to implement it already. We have some papers on that. But um, that's, that's what's happening. So in practice, if you wanted to give guarantees against a very strong adversary like alpha equals infinity, maybe I can implement in, 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 I could implement it for some alpha that's not infinity. I don't know. I'm just thinking about it in a practical sense. So, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the way I kind of look at it is what you were saying is that expectation of the alpha at the moment is boundless, right, of this probability ratios, right, expectation. That's the way I look at many differential privacy, right, mm -hmm. um, that's boundless. But, you know, I mean, once you raise a, from, like, a somewhat practical point of view, once you raise something to the power of, like, 10, it's basically... Yeah. The max. <laughs> practical. Yeah, so you're right. You're right. You've already you've already you've narrowed your space down to just one point. If you're saying so, expectation of the tenth moment is bounded, that's kind of like saying you know, I mean you can of course come up with cases that's not just where that's not true, right? But so the space we're playing in is like one to ten. Yeah. And then yeah. Okay. I, I don't know. I mean you know, I mean uh, again, I um, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we have a lunch break. And when do we reconvene? It's like 1.30, I think. Yeah, I think I have to look it up.